Greetings, it's Dr. Keisha here. Welcome back to the course, and I hope that you are well and that things are going smoothly so far. Again, if they're not, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Use the group me link, or you can send me an email and we can hop on a collaboration call if necessary. Chapter three is all about business intelligence. And this is one of my favorite chapters because my dissertation is all about business intelligence. So I created an information extraction system to analyze 10K reports. And I use the text analytics to study what managers would put into their 10K reports. So I love business intelligence. So let's get into it. Here's your outline and we will get started with some of the patterns and relationships and trends that occur in business intelligence. So I have a question for you to get started. In your field of study, so whatever your major is, I want you to think about two examples of how business intelligence is used. So hopefully at this point, you've already read the chapter. So you're a little bit familiar with BI as I'll call it in the course. So think about two examples of how business intelligence is used. For example, let's say that you are in music business and you are helping to plan out a tour and you're interested in knowing which cities should your artist tour and you can use analytics from similar artists who have visited cities to see what was the ticket sales what were the ticket sales where would be a good place to go based on past patterns past trends that you can now use and extrapolate to the future that's what business intelligence is all about you must have past data in order to predict what's going to have in the happen in the future. So let's look at some other uses for BI. Let's say, for example, one of my favorite examples is uh, Netflix and or Amazon. So let's say you purchase a book from Amazon and at, before you check out, you see a pop up that says uh, customers who also bought this who bought this also purchased and is giving you that opportunity to add something additional to your cart. Also, Netflix has data on what you're watching and people who have watched similar programs as you. And now they have um, that ability in the Netflix app to show you some similar movies. That's business intelligence. It's just data mining of what has happened in the past to help you identify something that you may enjoy in the future. One of my favorite examples, well, I have a lot of favorite examples, obviously, because this is an area that I'm very interested in, is predictive policing. So we're gonna watch a quick video. On predictive policing. said, I want this crime problem fixed. And he got him a crime fight. Everything was working before. No, it wasn't working before. And why do you need this? Because you've got to keep up with the time and you've got to move with technology. You show the mayor what you got. He supports you. And he goes before council. Council gives you support because at the end of the day, everybody wants to reduce crime and everybody wants a safe community because without it, you don't have economic growth. You don't have anything. That's kind of where we started when crime started rising back in 2005. By the time you got the information, the information was old. By the time you put out a plan, you're working on something, and it's changed three or four times since then. We were still doing things the way we'd always done them. When you do that, and you can expect the same results. We started out with the uh, University of Memphis. They came in and used IBM's uh, SPSS to create a statistical package 
and that's kind of where Blue Crush was formed. Crush is crime reduction utilizing statistical history. So using the data, using the history of crime to predict where you're going next and how are you going to deploy officers. Say an officer gets a, a call on a burglary, he goes out to the scene, takes his PDA into the house with him, and he takes the information down from the victim. When the uh, report hits the system, the crime analyst immediately has access to it. It tells us what our percentages are on all of the different crimes in the city as a whole. It shows each precinct commander where he is for that day, and where he is month to date, and where he is year to date, and where he is year to date over the past five years. The uh, IBM solution has allowed us to take a new look and gain a totally different perspective on our data that we've, we've always had. And that's why you're seeing uh, crime down 28% over five years, why you're seeing uh, crime down 14% uh, when we look at last year, this year. And that's why you're seeing those things is um, everything we're doing. Gosh dang, you know, you, you... All right, so let's jump back over into the slides. And I think that it's so interesting that you can reduce crime by almost 30 percent just by using predictive analytics which is a form of uh, under the umbrella of business intelligence so that's one type of analytics that you can do is predictive and it all comes down to analyzing past crimes in those areas now obviously you have to be careful with morally how you uh, target places because you don't want to uh, do something that's too unethical or that is unfair to certain demographics but if you can use the data to help predict those times and areas that gives the police department an edge up into pre into reducing those crimes all right so let's get into the primary activities in business intelligence, now that we know some of the great outcomes of it, what is the process or what are the procedures? So you must begin with obviously data sources. You can use databases, even social media now. You can purchase data, knowledge from people, reports, notes, call center, notes, call center, uh, voice activity, all of those things can go into, feed into the, the process. So we acquire the data from the data sources. We must clean it, organize it, catalog it. Then we can perform analysis on it. We can create reports, do data mining, summary knowledge such as you know what were our sales last month what were our sales last year those are all different types of reports you can do why did we have a spike in sales in december uh why were sales low in june you can perform those types of question analyses on the data as well as then third we're going to publish the results so do you want to push those results out automatically on a specific time frame, specific time calendar? Maybe once a month on the 1st, every 15th, or maybe you want to pull, the knowledge workers want to pull, so maybe whoever needs the information will request or pull the information down from a server. Maybe they'll log into a web site uh, and download reports or maybe they have to make that request in some type of way so a little quiz here to see if you're paying attention push delivers business intelligence only on requests from the users is that true or is that false push that is false because that is pull if you're requesting if the user is requesting that is a pull all right let's look at dirty data because a couple slides back here we talked about acquiring the data and everything that goes into that process well we must cleanse the data so in order to cleanse the data we need to first identify what is dirty about the data so here are some aspects to consider when you are analyzing data. First, are, is there any missing values? That's the key. That's going to pop out at you, missing values. 
maybe inconsistent data. Do you have first name, last name in some cells and then last name, first name in other cells? That will, that's just not very efficient for your database if you have to mail things out or you want to address a caller if the names are not consistent. Maybe uh, wrong granularity, which means that the data maybe is not fine enough. Maybe you just have high level data. Maybe you just have uh, state and you don't have city and state or county and state. How, how fine do you need the data to be? Or maybe you just have too much data, which is very possible. You can have just way too many attributes. And then when you try an attribute is what would be in a column of your data. But maybe you just have too much of it, too many data points. And then when you try to run analyses, it, it still doesn't make a lot of sense. So here's an activity for you. What I would like for you to do is analyze this slide and attempt to find every piece of dirty data that we identified here on the last slide. Missing values, inconsistent data not integrated well, wrong granularity, too much data. See where you can find mistakes. You know, maybe capitalization is not consistent. So I want you to take a minute, pause the video, and try to identify all the sources of dirty data. Now, once you've done that, you can look at here at the solution. This is just a example. I'm sure there we could pick through here and find other items. You know, there's a duplicate there that's been marked out. So duplicates removed, populated, correctly spelled, consistent, standardized. This is how you want your data to look. So when you're working with spreadsheets, with whatever your major is, it doesn't matter. At some point, you're going to work with spreadsheets. You want to make sure that you clean up your spreadsheet before you try to do any analysis on it. Now, here's another quick little quiz for you. Blank is a term that refers to the level of detail represented by the data. Hmm, what could that be? Granularity. Granularity is the term that refers to the level of detail. Moving on, data warehouses and data marts. Well, when you have so much data, where are you going to store it? Well, believe it or not, a data warehouse and a data mart. So a data warehouse is that larger warehouse where all data is housed, all data. So all operational data, a copy of that is moved to the, the data warehouse. We can clean it there. We can organize it there. We can catalog it and, and organize it in a way where when it's time to do some type of analysis, it's ready to go. The data mart is a smaller data collection of the warehouse. So it's just a subset of the data in a warehouse for a particular department or need. So maybe the marketing department needs customer information, sales information, follow-up data, contact information on uh, customers, and all of those fields or attributes are stored in a specific data mart. So whenever marketing is ready to do some analysis or reporting, they just go to that smaller subset. Speaking of customers and business intelligence, we can use RFM analysis to rank our customers. This helps us decide which customers to target next for our next promotion, and even which customers that maybe are not as lucrative and maybe should even be dropped from our marketing program. We don't wanna spend money targeting customers who aren't gonna buy. So in business intelligence, we can use and run different types of analyses to help us determine who those people are that we should and should not contact. So the RFM analysis allows us to rank customers according to their purchase patterns. So RFM, recency, frequently, and money, of course. So R, um, how recent has a customer purchased from us? How recent? So we sort them by their most 
uh, recent date and we rank them most recent how frequent how much money in one to five so the top 20 percent are given a score of one so ones are more lucrative than a five all right so the top 20 percent who have purchased most recently will be given a score of one the second 20 percent will be a two the third 20 percent uh a three and so on until the five same thing with how frequent if we have a customer who's in every week you know if we're starbucks and this customer is here monday through friday they're going to give it be given a score of a one for frequently as well as money maybe they come in but they only get a cup of hot tea versus someone who has is always purchasing our specials and maybe they purchase for the whole office they spend more money that would deem a score of a one so here's an example let's see how well you've been able to follow along which customer in this table is least profitable and explain it so i'll give you a second you can pause the video so that you can think about it which customer is the least profitable okay so if we have r f and m and we know that ones are pretty important to us and fives are typically not they're in the bottom 20 percent miami municipal would be the least profitable great all right here's another video as we continue with our business intelligence lecture i want to show you some really good examples so this is one of my favorite videos i know you're going to get tired of hearing me say that something is my favorite but that's why it's included because it's my favorite all right wow can you believe it at some point we may get there what do you think where all of your information about everything that you are doing is believe it or not being recorded somewhere and then all the systems are integrated if that happens then this level of business intelligence will truly be possible so there's also a video that I won't show here, but you can watch on your own and in, in, um, in an article actually. But you may have already heard about this one. 
ethics and data mining. If you recall, Target a few years ago sent out some coupons to a teen girl. And so you can read that article and think about where do we draw the line in data mining. So here are a couple more definitions to know. Again, it's important for you to know the terminology because even though you may not necessarily be in technology yourself, you will likely work with technology professionals and information systems professionals. So just some terminology to know. All right. Excuse some of this on the uh, header here that's overlapping the text, but we will continue on. There is a great video here for you to watch that describes MapReduce and Hadoop. So MapReduce is a technique and Hadoop is a program. So MapReduce is simply a technique that we use versus a software type program like Hadoop. These are two of the most important terms in big data, which you hear so much about in today's world. And big data, data is simply data that is large in volume. It's coming at us very fast. So if you think about Twitter, how fast, if there's a trending topic, how fast that information is coming in. And also it's the big data has a lot of variety to it. And it's more difficult to store that data in a traditional database. So we can no longer use the traditional databases because it's too large, it's coming in too fast, and the data is too varied. So MapReduce will use thousands of computers working in parallel to help process all of the data. So a Google search is the best example to give you in this scenario because when you type something into a Google search, it's actually sending that message to thousands of computers all at the same time, which store these different websites and web pages. And if that computer has the information, it sends it back up the chain to one of the uh, processors up higher, one of the higher up computers, and then returns it to your screen. So it's using thousands of computers working in parallel to get you that information so quickly. Hadoop uh, implements the MapReduce technique. All right, so again, it's an open source program. It manages the computers and it's written in Java. We're almost there. Hang in there. This is a longer chapter because there's just so much important information that you will need in today's business world. So data mining, two terms I want you to know the difference between. Unsupervised and supervised. Supervised means that we know the question that we want to answer when we're mining our data. For example, how much usage do you have on weekends? Um, how, how many phone calls do you make on weekends versus during the week? We know the question that we want to ask and we can use a supervised model to answer that question. Okay. So you can work on naming some more examples once we get through some more of the content. Now that's versus unsupervised. So unsupervised data mining, we do not know the exact question that we want to ask. So what I mean by that is, let's just say that we're going to open a new store in, uh, or let's see, let's say that I want to know, it, let's say that Easter's coming up and I want to know which types of candy will sell the best. So I can go and uh, do a focus group. And I can bring together children of different ages, hand them out different types of candy, and let them tell me which candy they like best. And I can cluster and group their 
candy selections based on their age, based on their gender, because maybe the girls liked the chocolate better and the boys liked the candy better. But I, to get the, re, the results, I would not have necessarily known the right questions to ask up front. But through cluster analysis, which is unsupervised, I'm allowed to explore. All right. So there are there's market basket techniques, um, observations, cluster analysis. Those are the different types of unsupervised data mining techniques versus something like, um, let's see if I have a list of examples in here. I don't have a list of examples in here, but let's say um, time series analysis for supervised time series analysis, neural networks, regression, which you've likely heard of. Those are all allow you to predict values based on values that you already have with specific questions that you have. Unsupervised, think about the Netflix example earlier. It, it uses market basket. Amazon, in order to recommend you what someone else bought, that uses market basket. And support, you see I have a red, that's a terminology used in market basket to help us decide if you bought something, where are the customers who look like you so that we could recommend them what you also bought. It helps with cross-selling. All right, market basket. Decision trees. Again, this is just another way to use unsupervised uh, data mining techniques to, but this one uses a logical structure like a tree to help us determine if the customer is preferred and they ordered $1,000 or more and they use their credit card, then they're eligible for a 5% discount and an additional 5% discount. So a decision tree is a great way to program something like a cash register. Let's say you work at Macy's and you know how Macy's has their one day sale every Saturday. Well, they can use a decision tree to code into their cash register so that they know, let's say the customers, a Macy's preferred. Yes. Did they order a thousand dollars more? Maybe no. If not, then they just get a $25 off. But the register will do all of that for them based on what the agent will type into the system. Okay, and so the last link here, I'm going to let you watch this one on your own, but it's a really great video about meaningful stories through data. So what I want you to take away from this chapter is that we can do a lot of the analysis and number crunching, but if you don't have a story around it of why it's important and how it impacts someone's life or someone's business, then it, it, it's going to be not as impactful. It's, it's not going to be at, received as well as if you use a story to present the data. So watch this video. You can click the link in the, in the PowerPoint slides and you will come away from this chapter understanding a little bit more about why it's important to use stories with your data. All right, so let's just, I'm just gonna scroll quickly back up to the outline here just to make sure that we've covered everything and we have, and so make sure that you review the slides, you review your book, and your notes and the videos to make sure that you are feeling pretty good about the content. If you have questions, please post them in the forum, in the group me, or send me an email. All right, thank you.